This is Kevin Farley, and you're watching CF3 TV. And welcome to another episode of CF3 TV on Project Nerd. I'm Dane Michael. And I'm Jeff Johnson. No, you're not. Jeff Johnson is not here. You are actually the black sheep of our family. I'm talking, of course, about Dames Marvs. Dames, are you drinking anything today in, in celebration of this event? The old shock top. He's got the shock to the top. <laughs> all the way all to right, the we're talking about Black Sheep on today's episode of CF3, and we're psyched for it because we were able to get somebody who was in Black Sheep and who was related to the main character in the film. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about Kevin Farley. Now, Kevin is an actor, director, producer, and stand-up comedian um, who started out in Second City in Chicago, and... He graduated on to films, television, and um, we had the pleasure to talk to him this morning. And um, we spoke about a lot of those roles, and we asked him specifically about Black Sheep as well. So without further ado, we're going to bring that interview with Kevin to you now. So thank you again, Kevin, for joining us today. And... Um, we have a first question that we like to ask all of our guests um, because we are a cult film related show. Um, what kinds of movies or TV shows did young Kevin Farley grow up watching? And is there anything that you might consider to be a cult classic today? Uh, I don't know if they're cult classics, but I used to like to watch uh, a lot of Mel Brooks. Oh yes, they are, they are. <laughs> So I would watch uh, History of the World or uh, High Anxiety was another favorite of mine. Um, and uh, uh, Young Frankenstein. Yeah, oh, classic. beautiful. You know, those are uh, those are my uh, the ones that I would consider. I watched over and over again. Caddyshack. Nice. Love Caddyshack. And uh, Blues Brothers. Those are the movies that I really grew up on. And I'm sure you've gotten to meet everybody involved with those over the years. Uh, some, yeah. I never met Mel Brooks, but I'd love to. Oh, nice. Did, did you get into Blazing Saddles at all? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, Blazing Saddles is probably the top of the, top of the line. Nice. I love Blazing Saddles. Okay, so um, as far as getting into comedy um what was your i guess what was your inspiration for that and what were your first steps towards i know that you were with uh, second city for a time so how did what was the build up to to all of that coming to fruition well growing up in in, mid, in the midwest and watching primarily comedies all my life i sort of naturally gravitated towards second city down in chicago that was really the only from madison that was really the only place to go uh, and my brother had gone through there, so I kind of gravitated to that, the, the conservatory down there, and studying, and, and hopefully getting on a stage, and, and uh, I did that whole thing, the early 90s, you know, and uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of kids that did that, you know, a lot of people went through that, went through that program, and and studied improv and did improv shows. Great place to learn. So you do a lot of stand up now and when you do when you do a stand up comedy show, what would you say is like the percentage of completely scripted planned versus like in your improvisational nature taking over and just riffing on maybe the crowd or, or anything like that? Is there like a certain percentage or does it vary between show to show or 
Yeah, well, it varies. I don't have a, a certain percentage that I use my improv skills like in my act. I, I, I sort of let it flow. You know, I like to, each audience has its own personality, you know, so each live show has its own, its own thing. How do you handle hecklers? Do you let it go or do you hit them back? Well, you let it go for a little while and have fun with them for a little while. But then if they get too disruptive, then, you know, we ask the, the usher to probably get them out of there. But that's right. the nature of stand-up, you know, as opposed to improv. And improv is more controlled, even though you're asking suggestions from the audience. The audiences can tend to be more controlled, even though they're more part of the uh, show. Right. Uh, they tend to be a little bit better behaved. In stand-up shows, you know, I think a lot of clubs, there's a lot of drinking involved. And, <laughs> and I think uh, people sort of think they want to be part of the show. And, you know, they don't really understand it. That's why they have a lot of announcements in the beginning of stand-up shows. Don't use your phone and don't yell out. And that kind of thing. You have to be constantly reminded. Yeah, it's like like school for, for yeah, adults. Yeah. For adults. Audiences have to be constantly reminded to behave. You know? you know, and in many ways they're worse than the kids. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, usually with that you just... Um, let it take its own course. So most of the time, uh, a heckler is is pretty drunk, and they're going to say something pretty stupid pretty quickly. So you just let that take its course. <laughs> so are you getting back out there on the road now that um, shows and events are starting to happen again? Do you have any plans to do that? or? This weekend, I'm in Algonquin, Maine at Jonathan's in Algonquin, and uh, I will be um, in Wisconsin at the uh, Kenosha Comedy Club. And, uh, yeah, I'm starting to get going there. You ever, uh, have you ever been to Omaha, Nebraska for a show? Sure. I would, we would love to have you. I would, yeah, it would be great. Oh, if, if, you, if you can get out here, you know. I love Omaha. I've been there many times, yeah. Uh, good steak here. <laughs> Very good. Very good food out there in Nebraska. So I have a question for you. Uh, things are picking up, obviously, with COVID. Um, I mean, it's not gone, obviously, but on the on the way out, everyone seems to be going out. Do you find it more difficult now to find things because there's so many people trying to slam in the doors at the same time, or is it about the same as it was before? Uh, what was the question again? It, um... Basically, <clears throat> I'm, we're in a band, so we are trying to get gigs now that COVID has basically subsided, and it, it's more difficult because everyone's trying to do it. Yeah, um, you're right. Have you found that experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because everyone's trying to get back into the, the pre-COVID days. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know, being out for so long, they want to jump back into the groove. Kind of took it for granted a little bit that we could um, just we kind of took it for granted that we could gig anytime we wanted to and then all of a sudden everybody wants to do it and there's less spots available it seems that's for sure that's for sure i'm having that same issue yeah so kevin we want to ask you some questions about um your directing career um right. we actually recently watched a paranormal movie Right, which um, people can see right now at the time this is airing on uh, Tubi TV if they like, and um, we just watched that recently. Um, found some very <laughs> good, <laughs> laugh, um, funny scenes. So, how did this movie come about for you? And I mean, did you see the original Paranormal Activity? And do you get scared by horror movies? Like I remember being just frightened in the theater by that and people screaming during their screening well that was the whole inspiration of that movie was paranormal movie you know and so when we watched that we wanted to make a parody of it and and uh, you know shoot it really raw and obviously it's very raw it was very low budget and we wanted to make it as fun as we possibly could and so that's uh that's the inspiration and we we got some friends together and 
and basically made a, a silly movie. <laughs> oh, excuse me. We have to pay some bills real quick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shock top. <laughs> now you mentioned it. It's the real <laughs> deal. But I we carry it around here in the Midwest, so I was like, I got to get that to. It's great. I, yeah. so. <laughs> I also noticed there's a Pepsi Max. I don't know if they helped pay some of the bills. <laughs> that, uh, um, that, that particular gonna... scene and line hit home for me, Kevin, because I am lactose intolerant. So. <laughs> yeah. Which I know, that if, you're, if you're from Wisconsin, you probably can't afford to be lactose intolerant. <laughs> yeah, that milk, that milk was so cold. I remember that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, had it in the fridge. It was freezing. What a fun ride of a movie that was. Yeah, it's silly, right? Just dumb, you know. But I, I enjoy silliness and making silly movies. And you mentioned it was low budget, but I mean, some of the stuff looked really good. Like, I don't know how the effect is accomplished with um, Deep Roy as the demon, like walking around the house. He like sits on the couch, but it's like all black, like <laughs> voided out. I thought it looked yeah. good. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I had some filmmakers on there that were pretty smart at doing that kind of thing. And it, you'd be surprised how simple it is, but it does take time to do. So it was time consuming, but it's pretty simple. But it's, uh, yeah, it, it ended up looking pretty good. Yeah. He's hilarious. So do you have to direct him much or do you just let him talk? Deep Roy? Yeah. Oh, that guy's hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> Funny on, on set. You know, um, I just kept laughing during the shooting of it all just because he was he's just cracking me up complaining about light beer hilarious yeah he's great yeah so um moving on to acting and tv career um we actually had dean cameron on our show in i think it was 2019 and we did a an episode about ski school and interviewed him about ski school and all that and we covered um the episode of it's always sunny in philadelphia the gang hits the slopes and um, I've for a long time I've wanted to get the trio of guys who were like just hanging out at the the resort, and you're one of them. Courtney Gaines would be the third one. Um, so we're two thirds of the way there. But um, tell me about working on the set of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. That is my favorite episode, by the way. It is. Yep. One of the best episodes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> a guy that fighting for custody of his child, and. Uh, you know, in the middle of this great ski resort and everybody's supposed to be having fun and I'm, I'm a real downer, but then I'm an alcoholic. So, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> start, 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 start. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Those guys are hysterical. I love those guys. Those guys are the funniest and that show is the best. It is great. You know, I, I mean, just being on the set, it's like you're, you're in really good hands. Like, they're very, very funny, and you know that whatever is going to happen, it's hysterical. Do they improv a lot on that show? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You're you're free to improv, you know. But you know, if uh, you know one of them thinks that it's it's not going well, they just guide you. You know, it's kind of like curb your enthusiasm that way. I was going to say, speaking of comedy uh, geniuses and improv. A completely different aspect and, and type of comedic genius runs that show, and do they yeah. <laughs> do they uh, do they improv that show as much as they say they do? Uh, well, it's much, much by Jeff and, and Larry and and uh, those guys kind of guide you through the scenes, and, but they'll give you the the you know the outline, and then you you run with it there. But they hire a lot of improv people. You know, people from Second City that are oh yeah, the best, Rob and that kind of thing. Your performance in this um, <laughs> that part's the best. I yeah. think it's my favorite thing you've done. <laughs> um, I hope you had a lot of fun doing it because it comes across as though you did, and your character cracks me up. So, <laughs> oh, that was a, a you know wonderful time with Larry and Jeff and. And uh, in that cast, it was such a wonderful uh, 
experience um and, and easy and fun and and everybody's friendly on that set so no i uh that was one of my best memories yeah where do you rank this as far as like um i guess movies that you've been in is it near the top for you as far as um the laughs and overall experience with it um i remember it was a while ago but I remember it as being a follow-up to Chris's Tommy Boy, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. Chris and Dave were doing the second kind of Tommy Boy thing, and, you know, and uh, it was directed by Penelope Spiris, who had done Wayne's World, so she was pretty hot at the time, and um, and Chris and Dave were really hot at the time, so this was a movie that was pretty anticipated. Um, it. It was uh, a lot of it was shot in Los Angeles, so uh, it was pretty close to home. And at the time, Chris, I was just coming into Los Angeles from Second City, and and along with my little brother. And he thought, well, here's a scene. Here's a good scene for you two guys to play. Um, you know, uh, security guards. Yeah, there we are. And so he, he made it arrangements to uh, have us, you know, be the security guards uh, in the scene. Um, we needed credits, you know, as a, new actors and that kind of thing. So we were grateful to get the part. And, um, yeah, it went well. That day was really funny. I think we shot it near the Pantages down there. And um, it was really great. There was a lot of extras. It was this. It was the day that Chris shot uh, when he was in front of the crowd yelling. You know. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, that was the that, It's my favorite scene in the whole film. If I'm being yeah. honest with you. So you were. Um, so you were there when like Mud Honey was playing, for example. You were there for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that whole day they shot that whole scene. Yeah. And uh, it was wonderful. It was great. Just great memories. It just. It was a time when Chris was kind of riding high on, on all of his success and and things were looking pretty bright for the future. So it was a great memory. Uh, Black Sheep was a great memory and shooting it was, yeah, things were, it was like the zenith of his career and, uh, and the start of my career. Really. So out of the three brothers, what, would any of you have been considered the black sheep of the Farley family at any point well, for growing sure. up? Or definitely the black sheep. I mean, <laughs> was, uh, out there, you know, a lot more uh, gregarious than the rest of us. And... So here's my question. Obviously, Christopher is your brother. Yeah. This movie is very funny, but I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but that you laugh at the funny parts and then the rest of it you're kind of just like that's not funny because you grew up with chris and that's just the uh, way he is no i never laughed at him no <laughs> i never thought it was uh i was always kind of shocked at what people saw i mean because we grew up yeah when you grow up with it you see all that kind of stuff like i mean i did i mean i thought it was funny i thought that people would laugh at it but i i had already seen it for like 30 years so you know, so, okay, that, yeah, that's what I was thinking. But now my question is, did he ever do anything that you did legitimately think was absolutely hysterical? The only thing that I think I really laughed at was in um, uh, Dirty Work when he was with uh, <laughs> Saigon. With Saigon or bit his nose off. And I think that scene in the car when he was, when he was going, blah, blah, blah. You know? Shut your cake, hole, Yoko. <laughs> Yoko. That, I, I remember calling him and going, yeah, that made me laugh. That's awesome. Shut your cake, hole, Yoko, and get in the car. I mean, that made me laugh. That that was truly funny. But, yeah, so i just seen a lot of it, you know, for 30 years. So not that it wasn't funny. And I, I think he, he was one of the funniest that ever lived. But, yeah. It's, he, was, he was great. So not even this cartwheel that he attempts to do <laughs> makes you laugh. <laughs> yeah. But he would do cartwheels, you know, throughout throughout our life. I mean, he was always doing cartwheels, you know. I mean, 
I w- I'd seen that cartwheel about a fifty million. <laughs> yeah, and you probably laughed the first twenty times, and you're like, "All right, I get it. It's a well, cartwheel. you don't do it in inappropriate times. Like he was falling <laughs> down right. during, like family parties and, and <laughs> falling down at like really fancy parties. That's what when we were growing up. That's what was funny because he'd always do the most inappropriate thing, you know, and it was funny, you know, like falling down in a party where you shouldn't fall down. <laughs> okay, so you had seen all of Chris's antics, and um, he had a hard time making you laugh. But what about David Spade, particularly in this film, um, yeah. and in general? What do you think of David Spade as a comedian? Oh, I think he's great. You know, I think uh, he's, uh, and they were great together. You know, they were um, a bit like a married couple, as they say. No, they they played well off each other, you know. That's why uh, <laughs> so many. Uh, that's a funny picture. That's my favorite. My yeah. favorite scene. White. Uh, no, they're funny. I mean, uh, they just played well off each other, and and everybody knew it, you know. Yeah, I often wonder, like, how exactly how many movies might they have starred in together? That could have been like. One of the great comedy teams of all time, probably. Maybe. I still think they are. I still think they are. I mean, yeah. you can't deny it. What's packed in this little disc is right. enjoyable. So, uh, I've been wanting to talk to you for three years now since oh. we started this. You're, you've been one of my, uh, and I was like, oh, it's never going to happen. Never going to get up, be able to get a hold of them. And I don't know. It's just a dream come true that you're here, man. And I thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure, guys. It's uh, Big. my pleasure talking to you. Thanks for all the great questions. And welcome back to CF3. That was a great interview. Um, but now we are looking ahead here to the films segment with Black Sheep. And, um, you know, this film is from 1996. And it is about a gubernatorial candidate hires a wormy special assistant whose only job is to make sure the candidate's well-meaning but incompetent brother doesn't ruin the election. We's talking Black Sheep, and um, Black Sheep takes place in Seattle, Washington, or mostly the state of Washington. And um, there's a lot of Seahawks fandom on display, dames. And um, that's why we're in this getup here. I know Jeff wouldn't have any um, Seahawks stuff to wear if he was here. because he, like the Farley brothers, is from Wisconsin, and probably, um, when he cares about football, is a Packers fan. I forgot to ask Kevin, and so did you, if it was hard for him to see um, Chris with, let me show all, all this stuff to you, because it comes up several times. The beers. <laughs> he's the got beers. all this box equipment stuff here. So he's Where's his duffel this- bag? Where's the duffel bag? He's got this trash can. He's got this duffel bag. <laughs> Fuck, I want that duffel bag, dude. And then in that same scene, he's got this uh, banner that's pennant or whatever. The Seahawks win the pennant. The Seahawks win the pennant. <laughs> <laughs> um, James, do you remember the first time you saw this? And Was it in the theater? Well, 25 years ago, this year, February 2nd, I believe this film came out. 25 years ago. Um, I do remember watching it. I don't know if it was in the theater or not. I can't recall the first time I saw it. No, I just know that it was a staple of my childhood. Yeah, I don't think um, I saw it in the theater either. I think we probably both saw it on VHS for the first time, renting it from the local store um, and probably bought it, I would imagine. Um, But it has been a long time since I've watched... um, since I've watched it until recently doing the research for the show. Um, is this one that you have revisited more times than, than me or? I, you know, let's, let's just be honest. Tommy boy is the quintessential Chris Farley movie. And I've watched that far more than any other of his films. But when I get tired of that, not that I ever really get tired of it. When I feel like a change up, but I feel like watching that movie, but with a change up, I go to this because it's very similar. It's got a lot of the same humor, 
um, it's not quite up there with Tommy Boy for me, but I I do watch it a lot. I mean, it's got it, that same comedy team of Spade and Farley. Um, but uh, let's get to some of our regular segments here, um, starting with um, because there's no rev it up and there's no mad at the movies, mad about the movies. Um, we're gonna go with the Playboy watch. Uh, Dams, tell us about Playboy as it relates to this film. Well, the character Steve (laughs) likes his porn. And in the cabin scene in particular, there was a scene where he's found with a magazine. And I thought it was a Playboy. So I did a bunch of looking around, digging to see if I had the issue. Couldn't even find it. Couldn't find it online to order it. And then as we were discussing today, you pointed out, as you'll show in this photograph, that, that it it's actually... not an actual Playboy. It appears as though, and the head, the woman's head is blocking it, but um, it looks like it's going to be Playpen, but obviously supposed to be Playboy, and therefore I, I think it still counts. And I don't know, it must have been like a rights issue i don't know i don't know so yeah i mean and then there's a list of you know playboys issues that chris farley had an interview in and whatnot but nothing uh major okay Um, if i had them i would i would hold them up but i don't have any of them unfortunately well that's going to bring us to our um next segment For the memory of a lifetime, recast, recast, recast. I guess I will go first here. Um, I have to think of the person's name. Uh, I don't know the role. Oh, um, so Roger. He is um, Tom Donnelly's chief of staff, I think it is. Uh, or his like campaign manager, his right hand man. He's played mm-hmm. by Timothy Carhart in the film. Um, you know, he was he did a good job of being despisable, I think. But at the same time, I'm not really familiar with Timothy Carhart's work or his look. And you, if you know me, you know that I always want to cast somebody like more recognizable in a role, even yes, if it's a yes. smaller role. And um, so I decided that we should have. This man be played by Tom F. Wilson. Oh shit! Um, you know him as Biff Tannen or Mr. Fredericks on Freaks and Geeks. He would do a little bit, um, maybe like three years after this um, movie came out. Um, so I thought that would be awesome, and um, it sounded like you approve. You always are doing like Back to the Future cast members as total recast. So. Well, you know, <laughs> plus we've met Tommy. Yes. And he's fantastic. He called us he's, the E Harmony brothers, I believe. He sufficiently heckled us and our friend Bob Carey. But that was our fault for sitting in the front table right in front of the stage. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you got for a total recast? Well, I don't want to see this movie ever remade. So, I because you had the comic legend in his prime. There's nothing you can, I was thinking there's no one today that could do what he did in this film. Um, So I recast um, the band. I recast Mud Honey um, with a little bit bigger, because you know how we like to have bigger names in the roles. And there were none bigger at the time than Seattle's, and it's, it's, uh, area appropriate, time appropriate, because they were still very Rock active. Rock the vote appropriate. Rock the vote appropriate, because I've been to Vote for Change show where Pearl Jam played. Oh, yeah, Pearl Jam. <laughs> <laughs> Pearl Jam. <laughs> <laughs> but I would have liked to have seen that. Um, and I really, the only reason I'm putting that as a recast is to have something, because I really honestly think there's not anything that I would change about this film, but it would be it would have been uh, one more 
just uh, like the Seahawks gear in the background in every scene. It would have been one more boner thing for me to <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> to up my score one or two more points, you know, at the end of this. But Pearl Jam, it is. Sorry, Mud Honey, I still love you. Dames, let's talk about some of our favorite lines from this. Oh Christ. I mean, let's just trade off. Because okay. I'm going to start with, because I don't want you to steal it. Did you fall into some mud or something? Yes, I did. And now I'm going to be rich because I'm the only person in the world that knows where you can find white mud. I didn't say mud. I said crud. Did you fall into some crud or something? <laughs> <laughs> epic, um, epic line. I did write that down. It's one of... Uh, we had to. I think it's one of David Spade's best moments, or like moments in the movie too. Um, another one of Spade's best because he doesn't get enough credit, I think. And he, ha it's kind of an unenviable task of being the straight man to Chris Farley. Um, they still, he's still funny, yes, but like Chris Farley's the comedic foil. And and by the way. This, there's so much more physical comedy in this than even Tommy Boy. There is. Like, they were like, we're, we're going to take Tommy Boy, but, like, we're going to use every comedic, like, physically comedic exploit imaginable. Hey, Dane, before you give this spade line, I, I just want to tell you, Penelope... What's Spiris. Uh-huh. ...is not a fan of David Spade's. She said, I don't, ever, I don't think I ever even smiled at anything David Spade has ever done. Even wow. in the middle of making this movie, he said, you've spent this whole movie trying to cut my comedic balls off. Which is so weird because two years later, they worked together on Senseless. But So there was I a feud, was, but then they later worked together. I don't, I don't think it was that feud. <laughs> I just think he, it's, the whole thing is weird to me because Chris Farley got the script. He didn't want to do it. And he signed on to do it, and then they told him, if we don't have a script to you by this date, you can drop out of the film. The guy wrote the movie in like 45 pages and dropped it off 15 minutes before the deadline of Chris Farley being able to drop out of the film. And he only took this film because David Spade begged him to do it. And then to find out that Spade was at odds with the director, I don't understand any of this. I would love to get to the bottom of it, but go ahead with your line because I do agree with you. He's understatedly brilliant in this movie. Um, actually, God, now that you mention it, it's now that you prompt me to say his line, it's not his line. It's a scene <laughs> that he's in without Chris Farley, though. So, um, but he is playing some pocket. <laughs> hey, you got a little chubby going there? Dream on, you little fart. <laughs> <laughs> like he oh, him classic. Down. <laughs> he's like, gonna pull out the middle finger from his pocket and gets totally never mind never mind shut down. <laughs> all right well i'm i'm back to chris now that's one small step for man one giant i have a dream <laughs> <laughs> like what the fuck is he even talking about in that scene dude hilarious he gets ripped right out before of his mind. He makes eye contact with the Rastas. <laughs> says, yeah, he gets ripped out of his mind. Me. Gets ripped out of his mind. <laughs> oh, um, man. Classic. Okay, I did think of a good spade one. The okay. scene is, they're both funny in the scene. Don't get me wrong, because they're both high on nitrous oxide. <clears> but <throat> um, when he says, Rowads. That's a really <laughs> freaky word, isn't it? Ruads. I'm stoned. Limit. Limit. <laughs> Limit. <laughs> Limit. <laughs> well, I, I got one. Uh, it's a, a response to Mike. Mike goes, I got a bowl of chocolate pudding in my underpants when the uh, cabin. He goes, we didn't have any pudding in there, buddy. <laughs> 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 um. <laughs> or, oh, go ahead. If you got one, go ahead. I do. I can go to your mama's and start a small fire in her panties. <laughs> Gary Busey. Gary, see, and that's another 
when I was like, I could recast him, but no, I couldn't. That way he no, was you perfect. Can't, dude. He was perfect Gary for that role. Busey, dude. All right, here we go. This is great. I never win at checkers. Well, it's kind of easy to win when you never move your back row. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, um, you got off the subject of Gary um, BC too fast. I, is this the start of him being crazy? I don't think he ever stopped playing this role. I yeah, <laughs> he is Drake Seven. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Oh jeez, what is what an awesome presence in the film, though. Okay, you know how like most of the time it's David Spade who's like talking down to. Farley or like correcting him because he's it's like stupid and stuff. There's one Shut where he like he turns it around. They let they let him turn it around on him when they're trying to catch the bat. He goes, "You idiot! You can't catch a bat with a pot, moron! <laughs> <laughs> You're aggravating it." <laughs> and then of course to bring it all home. We've all been screwed by Governor Tracy, and now I'm going to screw her. <laughs> like, uh, um, epic. The one Mr. T hosted? Matter of fact, same one. Yeah. <laughs> that was Kevin Farley got a line in there in the um, as the security detail. You know what, Dan? I was thinking about this earlier. I, I want to quote it, but I'll just I'll mess it up. But I think one of the most brilliant parts is when he's on the phone canvassing. I, that has to be just ad, ad lib shit where he's like, we all have dreams. I had to do the other night, you know, and then he just goes off and he's like, that has to be like, you couldn't write that in a script. Or what about it? Oh honey, go, go get your mother. <laughs> he's like talking to a child. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, are you crying? <laughs> oh. I'm surprised you didn't total recast um, Scott Colleary. <laughs> no way. With like Jonathan Taylor Thomas or somebody. Um, so I'm he says, be comfortable with my recast. So he says, wrecked him, damn near killed him. <laughs> um, oh, also, my wife, Katie, you know her. Audience may not. I do. Only football play she knows is. All right, I want a 32 belly option. On two, on two. <laughs> <laughs> um, I even wrote down one that uh, that um. Now I can't think of his name. Dude from Animal House who plays his brother, Tim something. He's also like the vice president on the West Wing. Tim Matheson. Um, he has one Tim Matheson line towards the beginning. Season um, three, of what'd you Virgin think River it was a drive-in movie? What? What'd you think it was a drive-in Season... movie? <laughs> at, the, at the beginning, during his first antics. Yep, yep. But yeah, I mean, yeah, he has like a high tolerance for his brother's stupidity in this. And that role required somebody that was you know, seemed official, but also seemed human, which is hard to do when you're casting a politician these days, let's be honest. Yeah. I think I wrote down <clears> more <throat> lines for this than any other movie we've ever done, because I still have one more, and it's a Busey one. Go for it. Um, well, it's, I think it's Spade to, it goes Spade to Busey. Have you ever watched any Bruce Lee movies? Or no, it's Farley to Busey. Have you ever watched any Bruce Lee movies? I got every single one of them on Laserdisc. <laughs> <laughs> Laser disc. <laughs> Did you and think? That, do you think that he thought that was going to be funny? Now, <laughs> no. It's probably no. Because I mean, that was the height of laser disc possible. Po it was still popular. obscure, though. It was during but, the during its prime, but it was still an obscure sure, prime compared sure. to like DVD. Um, and then Officer Mihoff, Giac. <laughs> um okay that was favorite lines and um now we're gonna do i deserve more credit and do you want me to go first or do you want to go first doesn't matter to me i'll go first uh my deserve more credit is grant 
Hesloff, um, seen here as this is their friend. He's a very nice cop. Um, I think his name is Robbie in the film. Yeah. Played by Grant Hesloff, who was also, he's got some like small acting roles in, for example, Dante's Peak he plays one of the crew that goes up there and then gets stuck in the volcanic activity. Um, but in fact, Grant got into producing and he has an Oscar for producing a best picture. Um, he has two co-producers on that picture. Their names are Ben Affleck and George Clooney. Yes, Grant Hesloff here, Robbie the Cop, co-produced Argo and is a winner. He's got a, an Oscar statue that says Best Picture, and he's got his name on it. That's messed up. Wow, that's awesome. But cool. Very cool. Um, so it's up to you now. Well, here's, here's where I'm at with this. Remember the old... Um, film critic duo of Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, who yeah. both gave this uh, very two very big thumbs way down. It was actually one of the only, one of three movies that Siskel ever walked out of. Wow. Worth mentioning. He walked out of this. He walked, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I honestly don't know. Like, when you know, after, this is after Tommy Boy. So when you know what's coming, how do you? If not, that's your whole job, be prepared for it. How do you not be prepared for it? If that's your whole job, you have no business ever walking out of a movie. Well, and that's the other two job. movies that he walked out on were, I believe, Million Dollar Duck and Maniac. And those two, I get, but this one is not anywhere um, belong in that. So, I'm going to take somebody that was in the film and say that they deserve more credit because Kevin Farley was the security guard in this film, and he's been on CF3 TV, you guys. He's oh. a director. He's a director. Go and check out on 2B TV. It's free. Just download it on your, on your whatever you, you use for your apps. You can Fire Stick. That's what I use, so I don't know what other people have, but just get the 2B app, Paranormal Movie, I know he would appreciate you guys watching it. He started it and directed it. It was not written by him, so you can't blame that on him. But um, it's a fun ride to begin with, and I'm sure he would appreciate you watching that. Okay, let's check out the budget and box office for this. <clears throat> All right, interesting information here on the budget. I couldn't find a budget for this film anywhere. Um, Tommy Boy had a very modest budget and I can only imagine that this one had a bigger budget. I mean, given the success and that of Tommy boy and that being the entire reason this movie is getting made. Um, then you want to put up the graphic. So in total worldwide sales, 32,417,995 doll hairs, which is equivalent in today's money to about, almost 70 million when you account for inflation and whatnot. So that's a, that's a pretty good chunk um, in return for what was definitely under, probably under six or $7 million budget. If I had There were also guess. a lot fewer um, theaters then than there are now. So like 2092 was like huge. That's very wide. So I had yeah. no trouble getting into the theaters. And it had an average of six week run in every theater. So that means a theater that only had it two weeks, another theater had it for 10. So an average of six weeks in a theater is gonna be good for any movie. That's, that means you're making money. So um, those are the box office figures for Black as Sheep, 1996. Okay, well, Let's do this now. Let's provide our final thoughts. On I almost said Tommy Boy. We can do that some other time. Let's provide our final thoughts on Black Sheep. Um, we've, we're actually first going to start with this clip from Kevin himself, whom we asked to rate the film. And so he's going to give his score here, and then we will proceed with our final thoughts and 
flash up our final scores. Um, so here's that. So we have a question that we ask all of our guests, um, in particular about the movie of the week, which um, obviously is Black Sheep for us. And we like to have the guests join in with us in rating the film of the week on the Colt Filmometer, which is our scale zero to 100, um, measuring Colt films. And we would like to know what you would rate Black Sheep on your scale of zero to 100. Um, it can be, actually you can rate it based on the, uh, based on your experience, personal experience with it. If it was like a launching pad for your career, excellent. I could see you giving it a high score. Um, if you want to rate it as it stands against all other cult classics, like measuring it against Young Frankenstein or Blazing Saddles, um, feel free to do so. There's not really any rules except for the score it needs to be between zero and 100. Yeah, <laughs> or, or probably top 25, maybe. Yeah, because well, it's, I'm sort of biased, but yeah, top 25, maybe 22. Wait, 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 wait. So um, zero out of 100 is the scale, with 100 being the best and oh, zero being the worst. Best. So 22 would be a terrible score to give. <laughs> <laughs> I guess 89 or something. 89. 89. Love I, love, it. I love it. Because there's so many great films, but it is good. It's, 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 it shows off Chris's and Dave's uh, real comedic ability, you know. Respectable, respectable 89 to start the um, ordeal. So, Dames, continue on for us. Well, Dean, like I said, this was a staple of our childhood. Um, I mean, late childhood. 96 was, you know, a year before I graduated, a couple years before you graduated. But we definitely saw it in that time frame. Um, it definitely has a cult following. I think Rotten Tomatoes has this movie around 28% based on reviews from 30 some critics. But the consensus of this film was David Spade and Chris Farley reunite with diminishing returns. But I honestly think you can only watch so much Tommy Boy before you really want something else. And without this movie in existence, that would be missing. And we don't have Christopher with us anymore to continue on making these movies. I mean, he did some other movies that were fantastic uh, and have a lot of rewatchability. Uh, and I feel pretty much the same way across the board about everything that he was the actual star of. Now he was in Dirty Work, which Kevin brought up. And I honestly think that's one of his most shining moments. And he did say that that was the time that he made him laugh the most. Um, he was almost he was also in almost heroes which I hold in probably the high highest regards <laughs> than, than most people would and it's because of of Christopher Farley and he's, he's brilliant I love him um, what more can I say this movie definitely um, is underrated uh, internationally so I'll defer to you um, oh, and when we brought up with Kevin, like the parts of Dirty Work, we forgot like a line that I quote all the time. Anytime somebody's around the jukebox, I go, jukebox. Rolling Stone, Street Fighting Man, G7. <laughs> you just press G8. If you like being in the line and getting caught in the rain. <laughs> That. I mean, I didn't want to get off on a tangent because if, if we started talking dirty work, that is, I mean, you got like two movies <laughs> to me that are funnier than that. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so as I had mentioned previously, the thing that this uh, movie tried to do differently than Tommy Boy, um, which it obviously would not exist without that film having been made is that it tried to amplify the physical comedy um, antics of Chris Farley, you know, because they, they knew what he could do from like his Matt Foley stuff from his Chippendale stuff on SNL. Um, and they were like, let's just put him in every like physical, um, physically awkward situation we can for a man of his stature. So they've got him up there on the freaking like TV satellite thing on the van 
they've got him stuck in an airplane door. <laughs> they've got him rolling down a hill like seven different times and it's not I don't think it's a stunt double during any of it, dude. dude like I don't James. know I don't think they would do it now. I don't think they would let an actor do it now. Um dude, dude. when he sits up afterwards and he goes, What was that all about? <laughs> <laughs> there's like one there's one line like halfway through it that's like Kate, one of Katie's favorites and that's another quote that I wrote down stay strong little roots <laughs> and then he freaking falls some more but yes they're like let's amplify all the comedy let's have him do these cartwheels that apparently according to Kevin he's been doing since childhood um, but the cartwheel into the people while he's canvassing is like hilarious dude <laughs> <clears throat> I don't watch this as often as like you, Tommy Boy, or any of my other favorite comedies from the '90s. Like I haven't seen it as nearly as much as either Happy Gilmore or Billy Madison, as far as like Sandler stuff goes. Um, but every time I do watch it, it's like easy to get through. It's a breeze. I don't see how somebody could walk out on this, especially if it was their job to watch movies for a living that's a cop out and um maybe it had because i don't think gene actually lasted that much longer in life past 96. that's why but, but he, he was probably just ill or too, too ill to sit through movies that he didn't like i don't know but um it's a it's a very good movie um as far as what it's aiming to do it's not trying to be high art it's just trying to entertain you and it does and that's how i always rate movies on the cult filmometer for me so I'm going to be very close to what Kevin gave it, which was in '89. But let's let's pull up what we got. Oh, sorry, I should give you equal equal play here when we're doing this. <laughs> an '83. Eight. That's an '83. Yeah. An '83. I said an '83. I thought you said 93. No, 93. <laughs> All right. Let's let the cult filmometer go to work. You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. It's an 86.66, sir. Six, six, I guess we'd have to... I guess we'd have to go 86.67 because it goes on forever. <clears throat> it's like, All right. Like one of those. 86.67, Dane. Mm -hmm. What's this film? Just above Poltergeist, which was an 86.25. And just below Chopping Mall, which was an 88 straight up. And that's where it will land in the annals of history cf3 tv history anyway yes and next time you roll down a hill just remember to say what was that all about <laughs> i'll see you next time